kick it off. I'm going to speak first, followed by uh, Trevor and then, then Grant. So MRI targeted biopsy. So what is, a, what is a targeted biopsy? Well, up until recently, most prostate biopsies weren't, uh, in fact, targeted. Uh, they were performed in a systematic uh, or a template fashion where multiple cores of tissue were taken uh, from throughout the gland uh, with a biopsy needle uh, without uh, precise targeting of the uh, potential lesion. So with the advent of MRI scanning in particular, we've been able to see a lot of these suspicious areas and this has allowed a targeted approach to, to evolve. So uh, why a targeted biopsy? Well, it improves the accuracy of, of the biopsy and uh, reduces the morbidity. And those are the two goals when we decided to uh, embark on this uh, program. Uh, the morbidity of prostate biopsies related to uh, the number of cores taken and the, uh, the, the access, either transperineal or transrectal. So if we can do fewer biopsies, then uh, the side effects of urinary retention, uh, bleeding and pain, and also periprostatic inflammation is reduced, which has an implication later on uh, if a patient has surgery. There was a large study just uh, recently reported in the New England Journal that compared a standard biopsy to a targeted approach with MRI used as the, uh, as the guide. And uh, what it showed was that about a quarter of the men in the MRI group actually avoided a biopsy. In the cases who had a biopsy, the, the targeted group were more likely to have a, what we term a significant cancer, a more active cancer that carries more threat. And uh, fewer men in the targeted group had insignificant cancers. These are the sort of cancers that we think probably don't threaten very many men and can be monitored and, and left alone largely. And finally, in the uh, targeted group, there were fewer, fewer complications with respect to blood uh, in urine and semen, pain, and erectile dysfunction. There are several approaches to targeting. A biopsy can be performed while the patient's actually in the MRI scanner. Now, that's a very accurate but quite a difficult uh, thing to do, uh, expensive and, and, and takes a bit of time. The, there's the cognitive technique where you look at the MRI images immediately before the biopsy and use your brain to work out where to put the needle. And thirdly, fusion biopsy, which uses software to merge the MRI image uh, with the live ultrasound and, and provide a target that we can then put the needle into. Um, now, in terms of the accuracy of, of, of these techniques, Studies have looked at them, and they're fairly similar, actually, in terms of the, uh, the accuracy. They perform pretty equally. But the uh, technique that we have here is, is the ultrasound MRI fusion, which takes advantages of the inherent uh, um, good qualities of each, uh, of each scan. MRI is very good at highlighting uh, lesions within the prostate, and ultrasound is, is easiest for guiding a needle. You can see the needle quite, quite nicely on an ultrasound. Uh, we overlay the prostate gland uh, MRI onto the uh, live ultrasound, and then that's the, uh, the outline of the prostate laid over the uh, ultrasound, and we match it up so that the, uh, the targeted areas in purple and orange there are, uh, are demonstrated, and then the biopsy is performed. So who should, who should we consider for this? Well, when we're assessing prostate MRIs, the radiologist and Trevor will elaborate on this, gives it a PIRAD score, which is the likelihood that the, cancer, that the lesion might be a cancer. And so we think if, if we see a PIRAD's three to five lesion, uh, in particular if it's quite small or at the front part of the gland, where it's quite hard to direct the needle to sometimes with the transrectal approach, uh, or in a very big gland where uh, targeting is uh, where biopsy is sometimes likely to underrepresent what might be there. So in those circumstances, a targeted approach uh, is useful. There is a special MRI protocol uh, that's used. Uh, the angle of the uh, gantry uh, is changed, and uh, the radiologist uh, specifies high-resolution images with a slice thickness of 3 millimetres or less. So a very accurate picture of the prostate is, uh, is gained. So the first step is to contour the gland, and that, that really, that's the urologist's job, 
we, we use a cursor to paint a, a green uh, line around the outside of the prostate gland from base to apex every five millimeters. Uh, and then um, we mark the, the lesion. You can see I've marked the lesion with the red uh, pen there. And then, so that's all, all done preoperatively. On the day of the biopsy, uh, the patient has a general anaesthetic, uh, is lying down with legs and stirrups, and an ultrasound probe is then inserted into the rectum. And we, we then align the, uh, we align the MRI with the uh, ultrasound. So this is the picture I showed earlier with two, two areas of abnormality within the gland. Um, and, and here's the biopsy being performed. You can see the flash of the needle as it in, enters the uh, area of uh, abnormality and we mark, we mark where the needle passage has been so that we can refer to that uh, in the future. And actually performing the biopsy is, is reasonably straightforward. It's all the set up beforehand with uh, contouring and targeting uh, that, that takes the time. The biopsy itself is, is about a 20 minute procedure and uh, patients usually head home uh, the same day. So do we need to do a biopsy uh, in every, a template biopsy in everyone? And that's a point that's debated internationally. Uh, the template biopsy means taking a sample of tissue from throughout the gland. Um, we know that MRI doesn't detect every cancer and if we, if we add in a template biopsy as well, uh, we'll find an extra 10 to 20% of significant cancers. But it does come with some morbidity, and uh, I don't think it's needed in everybody, particularly men who've had a negative biopsy in the past, uh, or, or possibly in some older patients where you're really only interested in a more active uh, cancer. All right, well, that's, that's me. So, uh, Grant, I'll hand it over to you, and you can... Oh, sorry, Trevor, Trevor. So since uh, last August, we've done around 120 cases, and it, it's it's working very well with the uh, no infections and minimal morbidity. Okay, thanks, Drew. Thank you. Um, I've got a little bit of a harder job. That's very self-explanatory and, and it's really, really good. Um, so you can either take MR as a black box, or I can talk a little bit about it. So those who want it as a black box, go and have a coffee because I really need coffee too. Um, so I'll be quick. I'll be quick. And the first point is, um, as you can tell from my age, um, your, your era, we used to listen to Frank Zappa uh, rock music, uh, and that's important for later. Um, but Frank Zappa died at the age of 53 of prostate cancer, just to make it relevant. So it's not always the older people. Frank got his early, uh, and it was very aggressive. So why? Uh, why rock music? Well, rock music and MR have a lot in common, and we use big magnets. That's the, uh, that's the, the, the thing about it. So at the rock concert, you've got the big stacks of, of speakers, and they all have about a 3T magnet in them to make the cone come in and out. And that's what we use now for MR, is 3T MRI. So if anybody offers you a 1.5 for a prostate, they're not in the game, okay? You want 3T because prostate cancer is hard to image, so we need all the power of the machine we can, we can uh, uh, garner. So uh, let's talk about iron filings, just to change the subject. So we are like iron filings, and iron filings react to magnets, as we've got a 3T magnet. So if you put a human in there, we start to line up. We don't physically move around in the machine, that would be quite exciting. <laughs> um, but in our body, our atoms, or some of our atoms, will try and line up with the magnetic field, just like iron filings do. And they're the hydrogen atoms. Uh, and so they appear like that. So because that looks much more interesting than the next graph, I will put that up just to bring us back down to ground again. So on figure one, we've got randomly placed atoms in turning around in their own little, uh, uh, their little world in inside our cells. And then we put them in a magnet and they try and line up. Now, it's a bit like where's Wally in here, because one of those is lined up differently. Can you spot him? Yeah, very good. You're all awake. Fantastic. So there he is. He's pointing the other way. Now, there's always so many crowd that points the other way, isn't it? You know? It's, you know we're not uniform. Uh, there's always a little, uh, little bright spot there who wants to do something differently. Now, he's the important one, because when you line up all these atoms, we can't actually see them. When they go the other way, we can spot them with MR. So they're the ones we want. We're targeting about one in a hundred of the atoms that respond to the magnetic field strength for the MR image. 
And he's what's called, uh, well, I'll go back a bit. He also does something that's called procession. Now, anybody, we all know about procession, but it's not a word we use because it was what we did with a kid. We had a gyroscope. Remember playing gyroscopes? They whirled around on top of the spike. That's what atoms do, and that's called procession. The Earth processes as well. Um, lots of things process. It's, it's to do with chaos theory, I think. But anyway, we, we process, and processing is important because there's our gyroscope, because we can process one way or the other. So here is one of them is the 100, well, the 99 normal people, and one is the, is the oddball, the one we want. And he, if you make him process, you can hit him with a, an RF field, a, a radio wave, and he flips. And it's that signal when he flips that gives us the whole of the MR image. So there's a bit of physics. I hope I haven't bored you with that, because it's, it's quite exciting, really. Uh, well, to geeks it is. Um, and then, of course, the most important thing, which speakers never do, listen. Okay, because once he's processing in the high energy state, he can't sustain that for long after the RF turned off, so he flips back again. And when he flips back, he gives a little burst of energy out, and that's the signal we pick up on the MR. Is so it's, it's, it's the oddball who then shouting as he as he flips back to, to being a normal person. Okay, and we listen to that, and it's the listening that gives us the image. And then, sorry, I've got to spoil it after a nice, exciting, simple talk. So. Up here is the RF, we, we hit him with the RF. We also encode some information for the slice and to, to tell him when to, to, to flip back again. We also encode what's called phase, and then we, then we get this, this signal. And that is a very rich signal. It tells us where he is, what his environment's like. So it's not always the same. So if he's close to heavy metals, he responds differently to if he's on, on his own. And that's important because we give contrast. So, so a, a magnetic uh, or paramagnetic material called gadolinium, we give that to alter his environment. He gives a different signal when, when he's in that environment. And this is how we do it. Big donut. We always use big donuts now. Uh, radiology is about big donuts. So we, there, there's the donut hiding in the background. We've tried to make it less scary by blurring it into the background. But it's a big tube. So those who are claustrophobic, tell your the MRT who's doing the procedure you're claustrophobic because you're in there for a while, uh, and they'll give you some meds to make you feel happy. Um, but as I mentioned before, uh, the, the prostate's a difficult gland to image, so we have to try and make things easier. So we actually put what we call these uh, receiver and transmit coils on. So this obviously is a woman. I'm not quite sure why she is, is, is um, in this picture because we're talking about prostates, but anyway. Um, sometimes the materials are, you know, even doctors can spot the difference. Uh, anyway, here we go. So we, we've got, I've got the prostate coil on her, okay? And that's, we've got it close up so we get a better signal. As I said before, it's hard to, to image, but we try our best. So what we need is the 3T, and that's very important. Okay, so New Zealand has been moving from 1.5, the standard workhorse MR. There's a lot of them around still, great for spines, great for knees, great for brains. But if you want a prostate image, go, go 3T. I really, that's the most important thing there. And then we have this thing called multi-parametric MRI. So again, if... if the place you've been referred to doesn't mention uh, MP MRI. You're on the wrong site, okay? Because it's the the grouping of these multiple parameters that gives you the PIRAD score, which uh, Rod mentioned before, okay? And be but, but radiologists are very simple. We, we work with black and white images because color is a bit difficult for us, okay? We give one answer, yes or no. But in prostate, we give multiple answers, up to five in the PIRAD score. And the more pluses you get, the, the worse your, pro your prostate cancer is. And we mix the evidence from these. I said that signal was rich with content, so we can take what's called T2-weighted images, DWI, which is, this stands for diffusion-weighted images, we give contrast uh, to the MR I mentioned, and there's also a thing called spectroscopy. So we're blending all these different types of the image to give you an answer, and we give you a PIRAD score. And a few pictures. The radiologists always like making pictures. Okay, we're, we're simple people. Uh, Rod's already meant, has shown it to you, but it's the gland that sits here in the base of your pelvis, pubic bone in the front, 
uh, diddle for whittling in front of that, and the prostate, uh, sorry, and the bladder above it, rectum at the back. Okay, so this is where we're dealing. And this bit of bone actually is hard because calcium destroys our MR signal. So this is why we need to put the power up into it. Okay, here it is again. And as we age, we get a lot of change in our prostate that makes it rather what we call heterogeneous, that the signals are variable. So we're trying to find the abnormal in an already um, heterogeneous signal or, or a variable signal. And we're looking for little small areas. Okay, here it is. It's bright on T2. Okay. And here we've got the DWI image, and it's bright here, okay? We've flattened out the rest of the gland. We do a lot of software uh, manipulation of the image to make it appear. And to make it, uh, because to prove it's real, after we've done all that, we also, we take what's called the ADC map here, and it has to be the opposite, okay? We use contrast, and here I mentioned gadolinium before. Here's contrast coming through. This is in the uh, femoral vessels, the pulse you can feel in your groin. And here is the gland, and in this light, can I see it? I think it's here. It's, it's very, we need the lights down. Radiologists work in the dark with troglodytes. Okay, so we can see the screen. We're looking for subtle changes. And, I, and um, uh, so uh, we combine all those and we give you a pi red score. I won't go through the scoring system, but the higher the score, three to five is what you want. Okay, and it gives you a diagnosis. But most important for, for this, car, this uh, presentation today, it gives you an anatomical framework. Okay, ultrasound is great in real time, great for sticking needles in, you get bright, bright echoes along your needle line, but you can't reproduce it because you don't know where, exactly where you are in real time. So that's why you need the frame, and the MR gives this anatomical framework that urologists use for the biopsy, okay? And I'll be talking this afternoon if you want me to come back, I'll be talking about PET-CT or PSMA imaging, and that also can be fused, and that's really quite exciting work we're just starting to explore. So that's MR uh, 101 very quickly, hopefully it wasn't too boring, but we'll get back to the, uh, the clinical side of it. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the contribution Trevor's made to imaging in this town, the uh, establishment of the T3 scan has been a, a real boon for us as practicing urologists. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Iwi for their warm welcome to this wonderful city that we live in. It is certainly the best city in the, in the country, far better than Auckland and Christchurch. And uh, I, I'm fortunate to live in the best suburb. It's called Seatoon, named after Mr. C, who discovered it on his way back from the Tokyo Olympics in 1964. And this is the view outside my window here. This is actually Dr. Studd's weekend yacht. And <laughs> it's called Fusion Solstice, named after his mother-in-law, <laughs> Nancy Solstice. It's interesting that we're using a imperfect test, 30 or 40 years old, to make uh, important decisions regarding prostate cancer management. And uh, I think we're fortunate to be living in this age where things are changing. And uh, we're relying more and more on imaging nowadays, and it's certainly great to be practicing in the, in the era of better imaging. And uh, I wanted to uh, um, highlight the difficulty we had. This was an advertisement from so, some social get-together outfit. but. Um, Finding prostate cancer, as we all know, is like the needle in the proverbial, except not going through fresh air through the bowel, which has its own problems, as, as Rod outlined. And uh, I wanted to present a few clinical scenarios today that I've been involved with over the last month or two. Of course, we do the targeted biopsies where the PSA is elevated, and particularly when there's been previous negative biopsies. Um, Rod outlined the difficult sites in the prostate that can be very difficult to target. And it is also useful in those chaps on surveillance. And uh, I'll just proceed through with a, a couple of examples. Martin's a very fit engineer. And you can see his PSA rose over a couple of years, 4.2 up to 5.6. And he had an MRI scan that showed and uh, you can see the nasty area there down on the left-hand side. Not as good as the uh, shots that Trevor showed. And um, this is on the diffusion scan. 
And Rod outlined the technique, and I just wanted to sort of put it into the context of the operating theatre. So the software that we have on our device outlines uh, the prostate, and we uh, contour the prostate from the top to the bottom, down to the urethra from the bladder. And we also outline the uh, nasty area of suspicion there. And um, the whole idea is to match this with real-time ultrasound in the operating theatre. Now, it's a bit of a crowded slide, but this articulated arm here is bolted onto the operating table and comes down to the bottom of the table here. And the whole purpose is to lock the ultrasound scan in on this um, stepping unit. And there there's the stepping unit loaded with the ultrasound scanner that's about to go into somebody's bottom. And uh, to keep it nice and clean, we put it in the shower cap. And uh, here's our ultrasound scanner here. And you can see the um, image of the prostate here showing up. And there's the uh, scan already set to go with the MRI contoured lesion um, overlaid on the ultrasound image of the prostate. Now you can see that the, the everything has a contour here, uh, has a coordinate here, ranging from one to five, and this just gives us a spatial orientation in the prostate. So we will biopsy along these coordinates, and we plonk this uh, virtual grid onto an actual grid. Uh, that looks like this, so there's the actual grid against the patient there, and we'll be um, using those virtual contours to match with the uh, virtual grid to match with the actual grid in position there. The nasty biopsy needle, many of you in this room will be familiar with. Sorry, this is a wee bit uh, out of focus here, but it cuts a core of about two centimetres uh, quickly, and here it is going into those predetermined coordinates from the MRI scan. In Martin's case, the MRI uh, was used to target this lesion and it um, was a fairly high grade, group three, that used to be known as Gleason full pass three, and he went on to have a red prostatectomy. Bruce, a very busy businessman, very successful in this town. He had an elevated PSA of uh, and it rose over a fairly short interval, raising suspicion, and he went on to have an MRI scan, again showing a suspicious area down here on the left-hand side. And the scene there, and this came back as a very high-grade group five in half the cause taken, and he also went on to have a radical prostatectomy. Now, some of the prostate is very difficult to access, as, as Rod has alluded to. And um, just to give you an example of this, this, this fellow had a, a high PSA reading and a very um, clearly seen abnormal focus here on the MRI scan, quite at the front of the prostate anteriorly. Here's the hips here, pubic bone here. So this is traditionally a very difficult site to get to with standard transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy of the prostate, and uh, many of these are missed with truss biopsy. I'm just showing you the uh, diffusion weighted and the contrast scan. Uh, the, the lesion shows up very nicely, and this was easy to target. Again, a fairly significant prostate cancer, group three or four plus three in the old system, and he went on to have external beam radiation. This fellow here, uh, Mike, he's a venter up in Martinborough, and uh, he was diagnosed um, in August 2016 with a uh, uh, Gleason 3 plus 3 or group 1 prostate cancer and elected sensibly active surveillance. However, um, sadly, things changed over time. This is the lesion that we targeted. Um, his PSA rose, went up um, 7.1, then up to 8.3. So we re-imaged him, and interestingly, the repeat MRI showed no significant change. Um, but because the initial biopsy wasn't quite as accurate, we went on to have a fusion biopsy done, and the lesion was upgraded, and he elected to have a radical prostatectomy. Uh, in every talk, there's always a sobering example and um, this fellow here, Barry, 
who lives up the Cavity Coast, had um, an up and down PSA over time. Way back in 2002, he had a um, negative uh, transrectal biopsy. His PSA sort of fluctuated over time, went up to 11.5, um, and he had a template biopsy. There was no lesion seen on MRI, and this came back as uh, Gleason 3 plus 4. So um, we found MRI, ultrasound fusion biopsy, uh, very helpful in the management of the raised PSA reading. Um, we're lucky to have the T3 scanner and its high quality images. And I've outlined a number of situations where it's particularly useful um, when the PSA is rising and the trust biopsies has been uh, negative. It's very, very helpful where you can't get easily with transrectal ultrasound into the front of the prostate. And uh, I gave the example where it has been helpful in active surveillance. Um, it does minimize the number of biopsies that are required and uh, subsequently the complications stemming from that. Thank you.